Well, good morning, everybody. This is Michael Prettyman, one of your pastors at Grace Works Church here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In the year 2019, Pat Vaughn and I had a very unique and special opportunity to be a part of a homecoming at a church near Sparta, Georgia, which is about 220 miles from Chattanooga, Tennessee. We've been extended that invitation again this year. The name of the church is Horeb Baptist Church, and they're celebrating their 230th anniversary. This church was established in 1790 when George Washington was the President of the United States and only 16 years after the United States declared its independence. The state of Georgia was only four years old at the time. We have the privilege to provide the music at this homecoming today and practically every song that we'll sing this morning was not even in existence when this church was established back in 1792. Since 1992, this church no longer has regular services, but it opens up once a year on the fourth Sunday of September for a homecoming service. Trees planted by the congregation in 1886 still line the driveway to the church and cemetery. Most everyone who will attend this homecoming service have family members buried in the cemetery. The cemetery also holds the grace of five men who served in the Civil War. This church is located in a very rural area, and I can't even imagine how rural it must have been when it was established. There are parts of this church that are original construction, but most of the church has been updated over the decades and centuries. The most important thing that happened over these 230 years in this church's existence within these walls and on this property was the role that this property and building had in fulfilling the scripture Hebrews 10:25, which in short says, neglect not assembling together. On this hill in Chattanooga at Grace Works Church, I pray that this will be a campus to fulfill the purpose of Hebrews 10.25 for centuries to come unless God chooses to move us to another location where we'll continue to fulfill Hebrews 10.25. Pat and I prayed this morning that God would be glorified both at Grace Works Church and Horeb Baptist Church. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday, and to God be all the glory. Don't be fooled by Michael's words. He's out of town watching a football game, I'm sure. So, you know, just afraid to admit that he went to see Georgia play or something like that. I don't know. Well, I am glad to see you here because if you're like me, you probably were glued to the television yesterday watching about four or five critical games. So at the wee hours of nine, I thought, I got to go to bed. But, yeah, but Tony's got to preach, so he really had to get to bed early. So, yeah. Hey, it's good to have you here uh, today, this morning. And we just celebrate God's love, His grace, and His wonderful provision for all of our needs. Uh, I want us to be much in prayer for Michael and Pat as they are missionaries this morning. Uh, they are doing something for that neighborhood, that community, uh, which represents us, but more importantly represents, you know, I, I think maybe, why would you go all that distance? And yet it is to provide something that that particular community does not have and, and the quality. And I think why would God go all that distance is to provide something that we don't have. That's just wonderful, wonderful grace. So let's uh, keep uh, Pat and Michael in, in our prayers. Also, uh, Tony, in case you haven't uh, received the word yet, but uh, Tony's uh, father-in-law passed this past week. They're making arrangements today. So do remember Tony and Lana. We will have that information out as, as soon as we, we get it. So would you join me in a moment of prayer? Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege of coming to your house today. And uh, Lord, we've had uh, different kinds of weeks, each one of us. Some of us have struggled to get through things. Others have enjoyed ball games. Lord, we've experienced the positive side of life and perhaps the dark side of life. But one of the greatest struggles we ever face, God, is when we come to the end of the journey, we stand before you. But perhaps as difficult is the experience of those who love us 
and walk with us all the way to the end and only able to say goodbye. So we lift Lana and Tony and their family up to you this morning as he continues to minister to us, Lord. May your Holy Spirit minister to him. Lead us in this time of worship and time of celebration, time of thanksgiving. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Welcome to Grace Works. If you're visiting with us, we are delighted to have you here as one of our guests today. And uh, if you're a member, I am thankful that you got over the ball games, waded through the puddles, and endured the rain, and we're here to celebrate. Uh, Wayne is going to be leading us. Pam is going to be at the uh, piano. And so uh, right now, I think, Wayne, are you going to ask them to stand up, or am I going to ask them to stand up? Hey, would you stand up and greet one another as we start singing and praising God together? So, yeah. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good morning. Mark, good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. You did a good job with all the decorations.
Tani, start us off on the next one. Amen. Sing with us above all.
You know, it's easy to come to church on Sunday morning, talk about the ball games, the job promotions, the new cars, our pets. But most of us have another side. There are problems that we face. The checkbook is running low. There's a visit to the doctor. There's the plans to be made for the funeral service. There's the question of how do I forgive my spouse. There's the thought about your teenager. Is he or she running with the right crowd? Whatever problem you're facing today, I assure you, that God will make a way. He will make a way. 
he is the way. Father God, we know that if we come to you and trust in you, you will make a way. Now be with Brother Tony as he brings the message. We love you and we thank you for your gift of salvation only through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Okay, we got this side of the room doing great. This side over here, y'all are just trying to figure it out, but it's okay. We're going to get there. It's so good to see all of you today. It's great to be with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I want to take a moment just to personally welcome those of you who are guests. Thank you so much for being here with us. We appreciate uh, your presence with us today. And I also want to recognize a couple you may not recognize the faces, but you support them. Jimmy and Sandy Kidd, would y'all stand right now, please? Jimmy and Sandy are leaders of the homeless ministry that we support. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much. We're glad that you can be here. Once a quarter, we take up a noisy offering. It's when our children make a lot of noise with little pails and you put your change in there. And this past quarter, we collected over $1,600 to support the homeless ministry that Jimmy and Sandy lead. So thank you so much. And GraceWorks family, make sure you speak to this couple. Thank them for what they do and just put a, a name and a face together with a ministry. You have your Bibles. Turn with me to James chapter 4. For our sermon time today, I want to do a little bit, something a little bit different as we look at God's Word. I want us, rather than reading the entire scripture, we're going to read it verse at a time as we look at the emphasis that James has in how to grow in Christ. Now, when I was born, the pediatrician looked at me, and besides saying, ooh, that is ugly, he looked at me and he said, this child will be taller than his father. My father is 6'6". Six, six. I didn't make it. <laughs> but you know, that didn't stop me as a kid. I looked forward to that. My parents told me what the, 
pediatrician said. So I was keeping up my growth, and so were my parents. And like many of you, you take the door frame and you have your child stand there and you mark their height for them over a period of years. Well, we did that, my brother and I, we had our height marked and you could see how we progressed. But we didn't make it to that goal of six, 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 seven. But that didn't stop us from wanting to grow. That didn't stop us from trying to keep up with the growth. And as believers in Jesus Christ, We should still have that passion and desire to grow. One that is measured, and whether we get where we think we're going, that's not the important thing. The important thing is we're growing. Today, as we look at James chapter 4, we're continuing a series of messages that James put together and often is looked at as a collection of practical application to the life of a Christian. The book of James, when you read it, you see all these different ideas. How to acquire wisdom, how to overcome trials and temptations, how to control our tongue, our speech. And you might think these are not related, but they are. Because the overall theme of the book of James is Christian maturity. That which connects all of these different areas is talking about growing in our faith. This is not addressed to non-believers. This is addressed to us, the church. It's addressed to Christians. And it's a word on why we should grow and how should we grow and mature in our faith. It's interesting. He he raises all these subjects up. And today, the chapter 4, it focuses on fighting. And it's not about the fight outside, but it's the fight inside the church. Okay, this is going to be getting sensitive right here. He says, why? Why are you fighting? Look with me at uh, James chapter 4, the first half of the first verse. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? This is sensitive, isn't it? Why are you fighting? Why are you not getting along? And notice here when he says this, he doesn't say, why do you fight? Why do you quarrel? Why do you not get along? He says, why are you fighting? Why are there fights? Why are there quarrels? He's using the plural. In other words, this is not a one-time occurrence. This is going on and on and on. And he calls them out. He says, why? Why is this taking place? And obviously, there's no perfect church. And many of the churches we read about in the New Testament, they had their problems just like churches do today. He doesn't waste any time here. He doesn't say this should not happen. He doesn't say you should be on this side or that side. He doesn't get into particulars and call of what is being fought over. He just says, why is this happening? And he's going to continue on in this. And he's not just talking about fighting. That gets our attention. This was practi- practical. This was something that was taking place. But as you continue to read... He's not going to talk about how you should fight, what you should fight over. He says, why? Why do fights occur? Why do fights occur in church? Well, as he's going to show us and point out that in fighting in the church, it's brought on by what's going on within the person. And notice the second half of verse 1, it says, it is not this Is it not that this, that your passions are at war within you? The fighting that's going on with the church, he doesn't say this doctrine, that doctrine, this application, that application, this program, that program or publication of whatever is taking place. He says the problem is you. The battle, the fight that's going on is within you. And here he goes into this idea of talking about the battle within each of us. Not the battle among different groups in the church. He gets into what's happening in each of us. Whether we get along or not, he's saying, what is the fight that is in and taking place in each one of us? And and, uh, he points out this fighting and he's going to carry on about Christian maturity. He said the problem is the heart. That's the reason we don't get along. It's the heart. It's a heart issue. 
James chapter 3, we looked at last week or two weeks ago, and he said, You got to tame the tongue, you got to watch your speech. And he's not talking about just shutting it down and saying, You got to have the willpower. No, James, when he talks about controlling the tongue, he's talking the problem is our heart. And in the same way, the quarrels, the disagreements within the church, it all goes back to the heart. So now he's not going to really focus on within the church, but he's going to focus on each individual and what's taking place there. So he's going to give us some examples, what it looks like to have this battle, have this fighting going on within. He's going to get evidence of it. And look with me at chap um, chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. He says, you desire... And you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Here he gives evidence of how and why the battle is taking place. What's happening within the heart of each individual this behavior that he mentions, this is worldliness. He says you covet, you won't, you don't have. This is all for your own pleasure. The, the idea of worldliness and the system of the world, it refers to everything that's opposed to God. The world system is one of which we love and we desire to satisfy self. We're looking for what's going to be pleasing to me. What do I want instead of what does God want? Several years ago, my best friend in school, seminaries, I prepared for ministry. He was a neighbor, and while our wives were teaching school, making money, he and I were going to class and finding yard sales to go to. And on one particular occasion, Don and I went to a yard sale and we found the treasure of all treasures, a foosball table. We just had to have it. It's been so long ago, I don't remember how much we paid for this foosball table, but we bought it. We either paid $10 a piece or $20 a piece. I think it was 20 Why? We just had to have it. We loaded it up in the back of my pickup truck. We took it home. And by the time we got home, we realized what we had done. We just wasted some money because we just had to have it. And when we got home and we had this shame going on in, a, in both of us, we said, what are we going to do with this? So we took it to the, short, the storage shed in the back of our mobile home. We placed it there because we knew our wives would not be going into that storage unit. We just had to have it. Do you know how many times we played foosball? You got it. It was not until we pulled it out of the shed to get rid of it that we played not a single time. When we got it out, we secretly pulled it out, out of shame, and we played one game, and we loaded it into my truck, and we took it to my friend's nephew and said, here. We just had to have it. How many of you have purchased something that you just had to have? And we're all guilty, aren't we? I see those hands. You just had to have it. And like my foosball table, you didn't use it. You didn't have any idea why you put it on the shelf in the back, but you just had to have it. And that's the battle within each of us. We just have to have it. Whether it's a material possession, whether it's a relationship, whether it's status, accomplishment, we just have to have it. And that's part of this, this uh, world system, this worldliness that we talk about. Because we just have to have it. We don't have it. We're upset. We covet it. It's a battle that goes on. And it's a battle to satisfy self. This idea is, is one of which we covet, we want it. Life can't go on without it. And this is what James was saying. You got this going on inside of you to seek pleasure for self. 
And as you see here, there's going to be something much greater that's going to be fighting with us. Uh, this can be summed up as selfish gain and pleasure when we just have to have it. And in addition to the idea of coveting, wanting, having, he gets into the, the idea, he says, you have because you pray. You pray and ask because you have the wrong motives. Why? Because you're trying to fulfill pleasure for self. And often our prayers look similar to that, don't they? We can pray selfishly for what we just have to have, what we want. But the mature Christian, it's not about praying for self and what I want. But it's praying for what God wants. What is God's will? God's will, not my will. Where have you heard that before? The garden. Jesus was praying. And while he was in the garden praying, we have the account, the, re the response of Jesus to God. He said, God, not your will, or not my will, but your will be done. And that's the expectations of as we grow, as we mature, we seek his will and not our will. And this worldly living, this system of worldliness, this doesn't always come out as hatred for God. Sometimes this, this can appear in our lives, on our daily lives, as we to take total disregard for what God wants. And we're more concerned for this day about what I want. This is the battle that's going in, going on within. And notice it's a battle not only with the world system. The world system is what we call pride. But it also has a competitor. That's humility. The two are going at it. One is the idea of, of pleasing self. The other is pleasing God. And notice in uh, verse 4, he says, you adulterous people. Some translations say adulterous. Just straight adulterous. He goes on to say, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Notice here how he puts the two together. He calls out those and he says, you're an adulterer. Strong language. He said, you're an adulterer. You're unfaithful in your relationship with God. He uses the concept of marriage throughout Scripture. And he talks about the marriage that the church has with God. The groom and the bride. And he says here, you're an adulterer. If you go back and look at the prophets, what was the message to Israel that they preached over and over and over? You're adulterers. You're unfaithful, Israel. You're unfaithful to the Father. And when he mentions here pride, he talks about feeding self, self-desires. He's talking about you're not being faithful to God. So this fight goes on within. And this spiritual adultery, this is when we are friends with this world. This is a, a, an unfaithfulness that we display. If you want to love the world, James says, you're an enemy of God. Strong words, but true. Verse 5 and 6, it says, Do you suppose it is too, uh, no purpose that the Scriptures say he yearns jealousy over the Spirit, that he made to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here in this passage, you see God is pulling for us. He's jealous for us. He desires us. He chases after us. And yet we're unfaithful to him. We're enemies of God when we seek to please ourselves. He describes the unfaithfulness, but yet he doesn't leave it there. He says, I make my grace possible. I make it available to those who are friends with God. 
And those, he knows that we're going to mess up. He knows we're going to make mistakes. And he describes this gift that he gives us. He says, more grace. More grace is given to us. This grace stands in opposition to God. And humility, the opponent to pride. Humility is this understanding properly in light of who God is. It's an understanding of His nature, and it's to live according to His nature, desiring that. Humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but it's thinking of ourselves less. It's not trying to say you're not worthy, but it's saying don't even think about yourself. One of the unique creatures in God's animal kingdom is the puffer fish. The puffer fish is probably one of the most ugly fish in the sea. Many of you know about the puffer fish. When it's in danger, it takes in a lot of water and it blows itself up to a much larger shape. It does this to get rid of those who are predators. But it's not only this this image that scares other fish away but it contains poison it's extremely poisonous the poison in one puffer fish is 12,000 times greater than cyanide the puffer fish contains enough poison in itself one puffer fish to kill 30 people and there's no antidote for it the puffer fish, as you can notice, is very dangerous. It's very toxic. And unfortunately, as human beings, our pride, our arrogance, we can blow ourselves up. And pride becomes dangerous. Pride can become dangerous in our relationships with one another. Pride can become dangerous in our marriages. Pride can become dangerous within the church. But you, humility is that which fights pride. Now, he speaks about this battle inside, and he points out pride and humility are, are fighting against one another. But if you look at the Scripture, you see here in verses 7, he doesn't leave you hanging. He doesn't say, don't do that. He says, hey, watch this. Here's your strategy to win. This is the strategy for humility to grow in each of us. In verses 7 and 8, he says, The strategy is this, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Here, he gives us this strategy, and you'll notice as we break this down, there's a couple of areas that he puts before the church. Those who want to become mature in their faith, those who want to grow in humility, he's got four components here. He says, first of all, submit. Submit to God. And this submitting is when we are consciously aware of God's desires, and we place them before our own desires. Once more, God's will, not mine. And he says, submit, submit. Then he goes into this area where we're fighting the enemy. He says, resist the devil. Now, to resist the devil is saying, hey, we're going to fight with the devil. We're going to take him on. We're going to beat him. Don't go forward like that, Christian, in arrogance. Satan is real, and he's more powerful than you. Resist the the devil. It's a term. It's a military term. It says, take a stand. Don't back down. Get into position. And when we resist God, it's saying that here you've got this Satan coming to you, this power come to you. Take a stand. Don't surrender to the impulse of temptation, of sin. That's how we resist It's not a matter of saying we can outdo you, overpower you, Satan. But it's when we see the temptations, we don't follow in, follow through. We don't give in. When we see the time which we could very easily sin, no, no. That's what it means to resist Satan. But he goes into 
the idea of drawing near to God. Pretty simple here. He says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. And when you consider this, here you see you're offered an invitation, but also a promise. In a simple verse, easy to memorize, draw near is the invitation. You have permission to draw close to him. The invitation, though, is followed with a promise. If you do accept this invitation, I promise you, I will draw near to you. A.W. Tozer, pastor and devotion writer, says that the more we are like God, the closer, the more near we are to Him. Think about that. If we draw near to Him, we look more like Him. If we draw near to Him, we become more like Him. We're maturing. We're maturing in our faith. And that's what James is really focusing on for each of us to have the desire to grow, to look more like Jesus. In the instructions, he says, draw near. You'll look like me. You'll grow in my image. You will experience closeness, intimacy with me. And finally, you notice James says, cleanse and purify yourself. Cleanse and purify yourself. Pride. When it dwells within us and grows in us, it's the hindrance that keeps us from praying. It keeps us from confessing and experiencing this cleansing. Pride says, I don't want you to depend on grace. I don't want you to depend on God. I want you to depend on yourself. And this is what we call a do-it-yourself spirituality. When we trust in self and we try To do it all on our own. To cleanse and purify ourselves. To confess our sins. Is to place him on the pedestal. And bring us down to where we are. But pride brings him down. Pride says I'm here. And God is here. Pride rushes in. And pride. It wants to justify itself. Pride, it wants to explain itself. It wants to blame someone else. But humility, it leads us to confess. It leads us to seek forgiveness. Because of who we are and how we see ourselves as opposed to a holy, pure God. So what are the signs that the victory's been won in each of our lives? He'll point this out in verse 9 when he says... Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Sounds like Debbie Downer, right? Instead of joy, instead of celebration, I want you to cry. I want you to be miserable. I want you to grieve. He points this out to us because he wants you to understand. When we realize who we are, we realize our sinfulness, The battle is being won because we recognize the depth of our sin and we agonize over it. We mourn, we grieve. He's not wanting us to be depressed people, to be miserable people. What he wants us to do is recognize sin. Recognize the depth of our sin. And when we mature in our faith, we see that sin. And we agonize We cry the fact we are sinners. That's where you see Christian maturity. That's where you see the battle that's being won in each of us. And finally, verse 10, he says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. God's favor, it rests on the one who faces the seriousness of sin and lives in obedience to God. In verse 10, he said, submit, be humble, and God's going to raise you up. Mature in your faith. Grow in your faith. Grow in your humility. And God's favor is going to rest on you. And he's going to raise you up from the pits of sin. All because you acknowledge him. You acknowledge the fact that sin's disgusting. 
and realizing we need God's grace. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for our Savior. And Father, as we consider your word, Father, I pray that we would acknowledge our sinfulness. May we recognize the depths of our sin. And Father, may we bow before you. Father, we pray that the battle that's raging within each of us may it be won. May it be won out of humility to you. May it be won as we acknowledge who we are and who you are. Father, we pray that you would point out to us our prideful ways. Father, point out to us when we're led by self and not you. Oh, Father, I pray your spirit would speak, convict, and point us to you. And just as the scriptures we have read say, draw near to you, God. You will draw near to us. May that be our prayer. May that be our passion. May that be our goal today and every day that we're blessed. Father, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me in a time of worship, a time of response through song? But you may not need to worship through song. You may need to worship through prayer. It may be a time when you've heard something in Scripture that we've read and you realize who you are and where you stand with God. You may recognize the fact that you're losing. Losing within. But thanks be to God, you can have victory. Will you surrender to Him today? He says, just come. Just come, and I'll come near you. The song we're about to sing, softly and tenderly, not militant, not arrogant, but humble, come to Him. be seated my prayer for each of us is that we acknowledge the fact that it's not a fight going among us with one another it's a fight within each of us and may God win the victory in you this week God's blessings as we go out and may he win in each of us as we humbly come before him um, as you're leaving today um, First of all, I want to say thank you for our leadership, taking up for uh, Michael and uh, Pat. We're so appreciative of Michael and Pat's ministry outside, but we appreciate your ministry in. So thank you both for leading us. Thank you to all of our worship members. You've got several opportunities in uh, the near future. One is uh, listed in your bulletin. Uh, our daily bread devotionals are available for beginning the month of October. We've got plenty of them outside, and please pick one up on your way out. Also, our children's ministry is preparing for our fall festival, October 23rd. And beginning next week, we're asking you to start volunteering to provide your car, candy, and your presence and service. So if you can help out in one of these areas, please sign up this next week. Uh, I'm understanding Floyd Dean and his uh, grillers are going to be firing up the grill and cooking us some hot dogs, as always. And so this is not just our children, but it's all of us. 
coming together. And so I pray that you give of yourself, support, invest in our kids, but also get together and enjoy each other. Um, on a personal note, I want to say thank you to my church family. Thank you so much for your support of Lana, my wife, and me, our families. Um, my father-in-law, as already mentioned, uh, went home to be with the Lord. He is a very, very strong man of faith and a, a man of God. He retired as a pastor, worked for a curriculum company. He's someone that's had a major influence on me. And anything good you see in me, you need to give credit to my father-in-law and Bill Owens. So uh, I'm so appreciative for those two men. But um, I'm overwhelmed by your response, your prayers, your support. And uh, just let me say, I love you guys and I appreciate you so much, more than you'll ever know. My family is at, very much at peace. We know where my father-in-law is today. And so it's a celebration. We still grieve, we hurt, but it's a celebration of what my father-in-law is experiencing right now that we can't put into words. And so I look forward to the day that I get to experience what my father-in-law is experiencing. But I pray all of us will get to experience that. And you can only experience that through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray for each one of us. We know him. We know that we don't deserve him, but yet we accept his grace. We place our faith in him. May God bless you this week. And may he win victory in each of us. Since I'm filling in for Michael, you know what I've got to say. <laughs> the offering boxes are back by the door, so make sure you stop by. I already have. And we'll leave you. Y'all have a great week, and may God bless you, and we'll leave you with victory in Jesus.